Hi, everybody. This is Hondo Carpenter from Sports Illustrated's Fan Nation. Obviously, the Las Vegas Raiders Insider Podcast, part of the Fans First Sports Network, joined by my longtime friend. We're coming up on 15 years of working together. He also has a podcast on the Fans First Sports Network. It's called Spartan Pride Podcast. The one and only, the legend, the way of life, the great Johnny Shop. How you doing, Johnny? I am good, Hondo. We're getting ready for a holiday weekend. We're getting ready, honestly, for the tail end of summer relative to football because high school football, youth football, all that kind of stuff actually starts in my part of the country, in the South, um, in the middle of July. So it's just around the corner from getting a peek at what's ahead. John, I, we you join me each week. We go around the NFL. We talk about a lot of issues. And the first one is totally Raiders related, but on a macro, uh, I mean, on a micro level, but on a macro level, I think it's a huge NFL issue. And the assault charges against Devontae Adams have been dropped. First of all, I want to come out and say this. I do not believe that anyone in our society has a right to just bully people. Okay. I want to make sure that's really clear. I don't think that Deon, uh, Devontae Adams bullied anybody. I think when you watch the video, now I understand if you're a fan and you hate the Raiders, if you're a fan of another team, oh, and you just automatically think the worst of other people. You and I have been in the media for so long that we know so many people from so many other teams. You just know that's not reality. But this guy was in a place he shouldn't have been. We've both been on the field for hundreds of games. And you're supposed to stay out of the way of the players. He gets in the way of Devontae. Devontae gets him out of the way. Well, you know what? They're just coming off a loss. You're trying to make a name for yourself. That's my opinion. And it should have never been allowed. It was stupid. I'm glad the thing got dropped. I hope Devontae did not pay a dime for this. It's ignorant. And I'm going to tell you, as a member of the Pro, the Pro Football Writers Association, um, I don't want guys like that on the field. I know he's not a writer. I think he's a photographer, so it's not part of our group. But I don't want people like that on the field. Listen, I've been run over. I've been cussed at. I've been ripped. I have been knocked out of the way. Whatever. I mean, that's that's part of you're there. You're on a field. The game's going on. And if you're going to be there and they keep you a distance away but not paying attention and you get hit, I'm sorry. To me, this is absurd. It's just ignorant. It gets into are there too many people on the field, which as a media member, you want access for your people. And But, man, there are tons of fans down there. There are people down there. I don't think there's too many. I, I you know, I always laugh every time something happens. Well, you know, we got to get more protective. I, to me, I, I don't think that's the case at all. But I think you have everybody sign something, a waiver that just says, like, when they get their ticket. Okay, listen, something happens down there. Sorry. Nice to see you. Wouldn't want to be. Uh, I'm down there all the time. I, I'm, I'll never forget one time. Uh, I'm down there. I'm watching a play develop. And as I'm watching the play develop, I'm watching an offensive line. So the ball's thrown. I'm not even paying attention. Wham! I mean, I got wiped out. Was it their fault? It was mine. I'm watching the offensive line. I'm not watching where the ball and the plays go. My fault completely. To me, I just thought it was absurd and stupid. Your thoughts. And you're an attorney, so you bring – I know you like the opportunity to go after anybody you can, but I know that you don't do dumb cases. That's why we're also friends. So your thoughts. Well, there's a, a lot of them there. First is – just flashing back to uh, my time on the field, I'm pretty good about getting out of the way early because one of the first games I was at um, covering high school in uh, semi-rural Michigan, uh, I, I got barely tapped, but uh, enough to, hey, really get my attention. Um, being on a basketball baseline is also an area where you've got to duck a, a little bit when there's some uh, college basketball players flying over your head. So uh, I've been pretty good about getting out of the way and I err on the side of super caution. Um, there's a couple issues to look at here. One is on the, the legal side. So there's really two different legal cases. One is the state's case against Devonte Adams, which has been dropped because they don't find it to be prosecutable. The second is a civil case that is still ongoing um, that is probably going to go on for a while because of 
things like uh, discovery and getting a trial date and most likely I would suspect a disinterest in resolving the claim by the defendant Adams. So and I hope Devante got- just says, listen, screw you. I'm not paying a dime. Let's extend this thing as long as you yeah. want. Let's party. God. To me, this is so stupid. Just keep yeah, I mean, look, my look, opinion, my opinion, yeah. my opinion, my opinion. Yeah. And there's, there's a, a path for that. The plaintiff is making the case. So uh, they'll continue to drive it along. And yet yeah, Adams, um, you know, has a chance to defend it. And that's probably what's going to happen. So there's two different kinds of cases here, which are, which are just fine. Uh, the broader issue remains the amount of photographers and uh, technical assistance along with everyone associated with the team that's on the sideline that have to be aware during not just the 60 minutes of the game, but the warm-up periods and, and after halftime of, of what's going on. And unfortunately, sometimes these things happen. They seem to happen after the game a lot. And to bring people inside a little bit, there are efforts made by the NFL, by um, the media relations to, to restrict when people can go on the field. Um, the last time I was at a game, it was, there's two different kind of, um, you know, smocks that you've got on. And if you have one color, you cannot step over these hash marks until a certain amount of time after the game ends. If you do, we will identify you because you've got numbers on there and you will not come back and work in this building again. And you can deal with your employer after that. So it's not like this is a total wild west. It does seem inevitable. I understand what you're saying, that there may not be too many people on the field. Um, I don't disagree with you, but I see where technology is going to take it forward a bit. I don't know that we need a guy holding a boom mic or two of them on each sideline. I think that's going to be something that gets replaced. And there's some other stuff that gets replaced. And I don't know that we need 87 different still photographers on the field. I point to Augusta National as an example. That is the most desired golf event in the world to cover. There is media from literally all over the globe covering it, but you do not see a camera inside the ropes there, and you see a very limited amount uh, on the field of play, if you will. So this isn't unprecedented. This is as far as we've seen one of these go for a while, as far as being considered for criminal charges and a civil suit. And I think it's something that's being watched around the league because no, nobody else wants this. Nobody wants somebody to get hurt trying to work and 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 cover the game, shoot the game or uh, report on the game. And nobody wants, they really don't want, we, we don't want people in the players' faces after the games. We've all seen the scrums after every single game and guys and gals reaching cameras over and trying to get the great shot of the coaches or the players after the games. There's too much of that. And this case may serve as a standout example that there's too much of that and it needs to come down a little bit. So let's see what the league does as we get into this uh, coming season. You know, I can tell you as a guy that's, you know, at all the games and at practices, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example when there is a really difficult game and a big loss and a guy made a really bad play, you got to talk to him. But I always approach it with, this guy's still a human being. I'm still going to show him some respect. Yeah, he knows he just screwed up in front of 60 million people. But man, give the guy some respect. They're they're still human. I This is the problem that I have. And you know, on our podcast, we're not trashing fans. We don't do that. I, I The media, the way they treat fans just irritates me. I hate that as well. But sometimes in with fans, they only see them as, okay, they're millionaires. They're warriors on TV, and they forget their people too. I'm going to tell you a great story. I'll, you you know who this person is, but the fans won't. But there was a player I had to interview after a super major mistake. I mean, an embarrassing mistake. And I go up to him in the locker room and said to him, you know, uh, can I talk to you? I waited till he was dressed, got out of the shower dressed. He said, yeah. And we discussed it. I didn't think anything of it. Went back, did my story. And about eight hours later, maybe nine hours later, I'm laying in bed, getting ready to go to bed for the night. And I get a text from the player. Hey, can 
are you available to talk? And I said, sure. And I thought, oh, geez, my wife's like, what's going on? I said, he probably is not going to like what I wrote. So I call him and he said, uh, hey, you got a minute? I said, sure. And he goes, I want you to know something. I go, what? He goes, I already feel terrible. He goes, but thank you for handling that with class. And I goes, I really appreciate it. And he said, I know you had to write what you wrote. I'm fine with it. My family's fine with it. He goes, but thanks for handling it with class. I mean, there's a way to do your job. There's still people. They're still humans. They're still, and I know I addressed it in a previous podcast about Derek's wife comments about his wife crying. And 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 I'm sure that hurts. And I know it hurts because I'm a friend of Derek's and I, I know it hurts people. You still have to ask the tough questions, but there's no reason to be a jerk about it. And the way that guy got in front of Devante, in my opinion, he should have knew better or shouldn't have been there. Yeah, and that, that's what we want to see limited from here are those kind of incidents, the ridiculous scrums, the reach over. It's not 1993 where, no. it, where those things would have made more sense. It's not um, 1993 anymore. We don't need fans on the field period. It's an issue at the college level that's got to be addressed before it gets worse. And we don't need people getting as aggressive with the camera like it's a tabloid story. Uh, by and large, everyone is out there literally uh, doing their trying their best. And at the NFL level, there really is no question because the moment or two that you're caught not trying your best, you're going to be out of the sport. I agree. All right. I want to We've got two more issues to talk about today. The next is the NFL red zone issue. We knew earlier in the year they went to YouTube. We discussed it. Now, I don't get what the NFL is doing. Let's talk about this. Curveball. Here comes a curveball. So the NFL red zone channel will continue to be available on DirecTV. This sounds strange because it is. There used to be two red zone channels. There was the DirecTV red zone, the original and the NFL Network Red Zone um, that you would see on places like uh, Comcast, Cable, and so on. So now we have word that the Red Zone channel is going to be available um, to DirecTV folks for the first time as part of a deal to keep the NFL Network on DirecTV and DirecTV Stream, which is essentially DirecTV on the internet, and uh, UVerse, which is apparently still out there. So this is an interesting deal for a couple of reasons. But from a fan's perspective, this is not so bad. You've got your games on your networks. You've got access to a Red Zone channel. That's pretty cool. And for some of us that purchased the Sunday ticket package but did not purchase the Sunday ticket plus Red Zone, we may have access to this Red Zone also. So this may be a little bit of a feeding frenzy and a good deal for um, fans that maybe didn't jump over to YouTube TV or buy a standalone package or that were concerned that they wouldn't have any red zone access at all. Um, while some of us believe there are way too many games at one o'clock Eastern and the red zone channel is flipping around way too fast, the red zone channel is a big deal for the later games in the day or for trying to catch as much of a bucket full of action that's going on at once. So this looks a positive for fans that still have direct TV that were concerned. They wouldn't have any red zone access out of nowhere. This door opens and all of a sudden they're cruising along again, pretty well. All right. Now let's turn to, we talked last week about the people who are pretenders, no shot at all. I want to talk about the six teams that I believe are absolute contenders. So I think one of these six is going to raise a Super Bowl trophy. And I've got Kansas City. To be the man, you got to beat the man, to quote, to quote Ric Flair. And they're just that good. I know I predicted the Raiders last year. And, you know, someone said to me in the media, why do you keep reminding people that you made a bad prediction last year? And I said, because I did. And that's being transparent with your audience. I said last year I thought the Raiders would go 12 and 5. I was horrifically wrong. And um, but I thought the Chiefs would would not repeat last year because they lost a lot. That just to me showed me a lot more about their drafting and developmental. I mean, they had players who came in that 
that played that nobody could have seen playing the way they did other than obviously the Chiefs. But to be the man, you got to beat the man, and that's the Chiefs. That's a good football team. Your thoughts, Chiefs being number one. And there's only six I have who are true contenders. Yeah, I, I would even call them like the favorites, the people that right now you'd expect, hey, those are the, the teams that are probably walking in with the chance. The thing about the Chiefs is they've got two absolutely – nearly unstoppable players on offense. And until somebody learns or can figure out how to stop one of them, it is a continual mismatch problem. They lose Tyree kill. Is it that big of a deal? No. And there's more guys coming in. The stunning thing about the chiefs to me is um, look, nobody saw Pat Mahomes being this good. He wasn't that good in college. He could throw the ball. It's, it's kind of like a baseball player playing quarterback. But I don't think anybody saw anything like this taking off. And I don't know that anyone thought that Travis Kelsey was going to turn out to be an absolute dominant force. So you got to, like you said, to be the man, you got to beat the man. What I'm looking for is, will there come a time where their skills diminish a bit or someone actually figures out a way to slow them down? Until then, the Chiefs are going to be in the favorites category every year we talk about this. Second of all, I got the Philadelphia Eagles. I think they're that good. I'm going to tell you what, and this may surprise you. I think we had a different ball game last year if that field was not in the in the condition that the field was in. Uh, it Both teams had to play on it, so I'm not making excuses. I predicted the Chiefs to win. They won. I'm just telling you, talking to people from both organizations, they both felt like that field favored the Chiefs. Even the Chiefs felt like they had some advantage there. Um, but I I think they're great. I, I, I would not be shocked. I think they are a perfect example. Uh, let's go this way. Jalen Hurts, if you're picking a quarterback to build a franchise around tomorrow, I don't think you pick Jalen Hurts over Patrick Mahomes. But I think Jalen Hurts is a really good quarterback. It's just Jalen Hurts... Philadelphia has done a great job of building around him in his strengths. Okay. I don't think Patrick Mahomes goes to Philly and as good of it is and is as good of a quarterback in Philly as he is in Kansas City. And I don't think Jalen goes to Kansas City and as good as he is in Philly. To me, it's a classic example of coaches. Hey, I like this guy. I like his skill sets. I'm going to build around what he does. I really like this Philadelphia team. I have him at number two. Yeah, I mean, you're talking there about the fit. The fit around the quarterbacks is is amazing. And yeah, there's no excuse yeah. when you're talking about the field, but the field did appear to affect one team more than the other. So mm -hmm. I think that's a fair point to make. To me, the Philadelphia Eagles are the odds-on favorite to win the Super Bowl. They should have a motivational edge over everybody else, having been that close as they were. And Howie Roseman's job is going to be written about, talked about, studied for decades You've got the Philadelphia Eagles. They decide to go with Carts and Wentz, toss out a Super Bowl winning coach. Wentz turns into the player he is. Back comes Roseman, picks up the pieces, puts them back together, and the thing takes off. And the Eagles look like their roster is almost overstuffed. And they're only going to go up from here. They're on the way up. I like the Philadelphia Eagles as the favorite to win the Super Bowl. And I like the point that you made about the fit. Both of the quarterbacks have a really good fit. And if you remove somebody and put them in a situation where the fit isn't as good, maybe the quarterback production is not quite as good. We see that across the sport. We're going to see that somewhere this year. We may see it in New York. We may see it in, uh, New Orleans, we may see it in Las Vegas. We're going to see different aspects of how well the pieces fit together. But there is no better example of a perfect fit so far than those two teams that made the Super Bowl last year. And that's why they're favorites to have a real good shot to get back there this year. And this guy likes the Eagles to take it. I am not a, a, a fan of the Cincinnati Bengal ownership. But I'm an absolute fan of this football team. I'm a big fan of Joe Burrow. I know people who've been around him a lot. Um, they just like the way he loves his teammates. He's always with his teammates. He's always with his offensive linemen. I think I got the Bengals at number three in my list of contenders. I know some folks that were around Joe Burrow when he was a kid in Athens, Ohio, a good, good bit down there by Ohio U. Um, yep. 
I don't quite see the Bengals as that great a contender this year as maybe they have been. I think they might slip just a little bit. I don't know why. It may be inherent bias towards their traditionally mm -hmm. less than frugal ownership. Um, but I wonder if the Bengals window might be closing a little bit. I don't have them as, as, as that high up, but we are talking about favorites and they are definitely one, but what if they don't get it this year? And I have that planted in the back of my mind as the season goes on. I think the pressure valve gets turned up a little hotter on the Bengals than it does on the chiefs or the Eagles or the bills, or maybe a couple of other teams. So definitely in that list, but I don't think it goes as well for the, for the Bengals this year. Sure. Let me tell you something really interesting. We all remember Carson Palmer just wanted out. He was tired of the fact the ownership wouldn't spend money. They wouldn't keep guys. Um, I'm going to talk to you when we're done recording. I'm not going to say this on the recording, but I had a person, and all of our listeners would probably know who they were, and I know you know, say to me that there have been people in Burroughs' ear, you know, be careful because you don't want to be the next Carson Palmer you got a big upside, a big future, and sign a deal with them where you're married here and you're going to have the next 10 years of not being a competitor. I'll talk to you more about it. I want to get into that more later this year, but I just had this conversation with somebody yesterday. I can't wait to share it with you. Next, I want to talk about number four. I got the Buffalo Bills. I really like this team. They're solid. I'm a big Josh Allen guy. I like him. I like the Bills. Your thoughts on the Bills at four? I think the Bills have the second most motivational edge this year, if you will, to the Philadelphia Eagles. I think this is the year that the Bills probably end up in the Super Bowl um, playing for it all. I think the motivation is there. I think the storylines are there. I think the ascent is there. I think you're going to see the peak of the Buffalo Bills either this year or next. And it's all got to come together and you got to get lucky and, of course, healthy to get there. I think this is the year the Bills end up in the Super Bowl. Interesting. Then we come to a team at number five, the Baltimore Ravens. I want to talk about this because, again, I think John Harbaugh is a great coach. And I think he does a great job of getting so much out of his scheme developed around his players. I think John Harbaugh is the most underrated coach in the NFL. Um, I, I Rick Goslin, the Hall of Fame writer and one of my mentors, and I were talking one time, and he's always said, I can't believe more special teams coaches don't get head coaching jobs because unlike defensive position coaches or coordinators or offensive position coaches or coordinators, they touch the entire team. I think Rich Basaccia should have gotten a, you know, should get a head coaching job. I think he's earned it. But you look at this Baltimore Ravens team, and for the first time, they've went out and gotten some true threats at wide receiver. It's not all on Lamar. To me, I like this team. I like the defense. I like the scheme. And now that Lamar's got some weapons, he's going to have to show off that arm. But I like the Ravens. I got them at five. Seems like the Ravens are always a possible contender, which is a just testament to how good a work they've done for how long. But now we got some transition. We've got a new, totally new offensive coordinator, Todd Monken, coming from the University of Georgia. We've got weapons that haven't been there before. We've got Lamar Jackson settled in and ready to shift into another gear. The question is, is he going to a lower gear or a higher gear? There'll be some extra eyes and interest on how the Ravens come out of the gate. I don't know that it matters that much, whether they look unbelievable or whether they don't look like they're in the fourth or fifth gear, but the Ravens are definitely a contender. And the way that organization set up, yeah, they're going to get a lot more credit, and John Harbaugh gets a lot more credit when his career is done. He has overachieved significantly from where you look at his career on paper and where he got to the Ravens on paper. Like, this guy's going to be a head coach, and kaboom, off it goes. So you may have some inside football there that people are sleeping perhaps on special teams coordinators, and I don't know that there's a lack of them. Last I checked, every single team has one but there haven't been so many eyes and maybe enough interviews for those guys. Cause we've seen a number of coordinators get head coaching jobs in the AFC. Some of the teams we've already talked about. 
And some of those guys are probably qualified, but there's probably a special teams coordinator or three, for example, that would have been more qualified to, I don't know, take over the job in Denver last year than what we saw when the guys call on timeouts and the game's over in like week two or three. It's like, what is this guy doing as a head coach? Um, probably a fine and fantastic coordinator could have a fantastic year this year, but what's this guy doing here? When you evaluate a special teams coach, because of the fact that they see the whole field, they have to react and be aware of what's going on on offense and defense. I do think there's a little more situational awareness built into that position than there is a defensive coordinator or an offensive coordinator who is hyper-focused on his side of the ball for the entire 60 minutes. I agree. He is the great John Shop from Fans First Sports Network, Spartan Pride Podcast. This is I'm Hondo Carpenter, Sports Illustrated's Fan Nation, Las Vegas Raiders Insider Podcast. Thanks once again for joining us. Look forward to seeing you guys next week. Happy Fourth of July, everybody. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Johnny. All right.